the Lord, the difference between a man and a woman. Praise God. Uh, just want to welcome everyone again here tonight. Uh, my name's Pastor Doug, Doug Johnson. I'm pastor on staff here, and it's just a blessing, a good blessing to see so many men out here tonight. A lot of, yeah. a lot of new faces. Right here. Uh, I, haven't, uh, I haven't got to meet everybody. I tried to, but at, by the end of this, praise God, uh, hang around for a few minutes, have some fellowship with each other. And uh, tonight you're going to hear three testimonies from three men, grown men, who are not elders in the ministry. In other words, they're not ordained clergy or anybody. They're just men just like you and me, who I used to be before <coughs> God, because I is a pastor. But uh, they're just regular guys. And they've been there, and they've done that, and they've made it through. And we're going to pray and get them up here. And uh, just want you all to take this at heart. And I believe it's going to change somebody's life tonight. So, Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus, first of all, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to be in this house tonight on a Friday night. Uh, surrounded by the fellowship of your men. Your bro our brothers, your sons. Father God, we pray tonight that through the word of your testimony and the blood of the Lamb that every heart in this building and this facility will be touched by the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, the love of God. And we look forward to that. We look forward to uh, those men, all of us being touched. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our first uh, man of the hour is, is Rick Collier. I want to see you. You guys hear me okay? Yeah. All right, good. So uh, uh, first, thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me up to, to share my testimony. I, I did so a couple, a couple weeks back. But really just was a, a quick segment into really what we could probably talk about quite a while. And so I'm going to pull up the notes that I have. Make, hit all my high points here. Right, so before we get really started, I want to provide, uh, or also talk about a great opportunity. Um, that some of us here had a good, so Steve, uh, Steve Klink, we were talking the other day. We actually had church last Saturday outside of church, outside of the four walls in someone's front yard. And it was awesome. And again, this was uh, an opportunity where we were out there high-fiving, fist bumping, grunting and sweating, hauling away tree debris, and praising the Lord. It was, uh, it was absolutely magnificent. So uh, as these guys showed up, uh, they absolutely... Uh, again, this is where you see the church come together at the body of Christ, the hands and feet moving and uh, really enjoying what we're doing all out of the name of love. And so, again, you see God moving right there. So, uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to come up and just share my testimony tonight. And I um, want to point out kind of the importance of doing so. And so as, as you hear Pastor Chris and Pastor Doug routinely say, if you guys attend this church, and something that just holds so true, Romans 10, 12, where you see faith comes through hearing. And so, and again, it's, it's so, so, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And hearing is not just like with their ears. Obviously, that's, that's it too. But it's also hearing when you spend time and you just block everything out and you say, okay, uh, let me sit down and read my Bible. Let me sit down and read and understand this. Okay, and so that hearing is is absolutely uh, uh, where we all need to be and get to. I'm going to refer to, through uh, to several verses tonight in my testimony. And really hope to demonstrate how God is the God we serve is a living God, and where He is constantly moving in the last uh, decade and a half in my life, and uh, through these. And again, it'll show it continue to emphasize how. Uh, the same God that is today was yesterday and will be tomorrow. And again, so when we think of, uh, of context here that was written so long ago, and then how we can say, I just lived that. And the applicability where God knows exactly where we're going to be, particularly as men, uh, and, and that, that grand facet of that. 
So as we do so, just if you would, get your Bibles ready, because we're going to be referring, opening up just a couple of those. Um, so how many here know that the Bible is in a structure manual as we navigate this life? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, the other day I heard right here uh, an acronym of, of the Bible. So Bible is, is uh, basic instruction before leaving this earth. Yeah. All right? And I was like, that's kind of cool. And again, kind of new to me for that acronym. But again, when you think about it, it's absolutely true. Yeah. So every facet and every piece we find ourselves, uh, it's in here. The Bible addresses these facts. Uh, as, as a Sherman testimony, I want to point out some of the times that have experienced what I call divine intervention. Uh, some people call uh, where God's moving in their lives. Some people call uh, um, uh, so many things. But again, so that divine intervention is where we, in hindsight, again, you can think back almost like a storybook. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. But if you think back, it's so easy to say, hey, 20... A hindsight's 2020, and, and it really is, because you can go back and say, that is literally a story that God had laid out for me beforehand, and maybe at the time, I was just in too much of a rush uh, to acknowledge some of the facts there. Um, and sometimes in the moment, or even sometimes, sometimes like, so in the moment, you, you miss what's happening. It could be uh, a week later, it could be a year later. And it's through those that we have, that, that many of us, me personally, have struggles. Uh, we have roadblocks. We have obstacles that you know, we just don't understand at the time. And sometimes those things in life that will take us uh, to a place that would that rather kind of counter uh, to what we have in mind or the goals that we have and, and kind of opposite of where we think we should be and where we want to go. So you see, I'm a very type A personality. I think of uh, this is what I want to accomplish. I set out goals. I have point A and I have point B, and that's a straight line. That's exactly how I'm going to get there. And oftentimes, I don't know about you guys, but I'll have where my point A to point B is not a straight line, and God's plan is it kind of looks like this. Amen. Okay? And through that, in the last decade and a half, have uh, uh, God shown me really that it's not my plan that I really need to focus on. I need to focus on his plan. Yes. Because when that's the fact, then I, I again, I, how many times do we, again, as a type A personality, that type of surrender is what I really struggle with. And, and again, so, and, uh, and, and again, it is, it is something I really struggled with. And now um, I'd be walking out to my car and think of something and I will surrender to the Lord almost like that. I'm like, Phew, you know what, God, let's talk about this and, and just pray about it. And if it takes me, sometimes you go into prayer five minutes. Sometimes you go into prayer and a week later, you're still praying about the same thing. Why? But if you don't have that resolution you have here, where you feel that your spirit is just like, yep, that's it. Then you just keep praying about it. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So let's open our Bibles real quick to Isaiah 64, 8. I talked about those friction points. I talked about. <laughs> Um, the obstacles that we'll have, uh, that, again, they were not part of my point A to point B plan, but they were part of his plan. Okay, and uh, this is the Passion Translation. It says, but now, O Lord, you, O Father, we are the clay and you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. Okay, our life is the work of God's hand. Just like the clay of the hand of the potter, he holds and makes and sometimes even breaks when necessary. He refines and shapes us. Okay, so as we are that clay and we become amendable to that, to that potter, that's where, again, it's that fact that we surrender to our own ignorances. We surrender as men and say, okay, and I'm going to get to this term uh, in a little bit, but we learn to fight like a man. And fighting like a man is not this. And it's not this yelling at somebody, okay, fighting like a man is this, okay, yeah. we're on our knees, we're, we're sitting there, we have our hearts and our minds lifted up to the Lord, and that is fighting like a man, okay? Amen. Good point. Another one that comes to mind as I was thinking through these is Proverbs, Proverbs 17.3. In the Passion Translation, in the same way that gold and silver are refined by fire, the Lord purifies your hearts and tests the, 
tests and trials of life. You see, God wants to use us. He wants to use, use us as uh, uh, soul winners. He wants us to use us to help go retrieve his lost. Oftentimes, we need, we need to be shaped and we need to be molded along the way. And those life lessons that we had thought were obstacles were actually part of his shaping process. And what I thought was best along the way and what I thought my final destination in that point A to point B uh, was, was simply not the case. That it had been in that journey that God had been so patient with me and that he had so eloquently taught me uh, that I must first walk to him before I can walk with him. That's right. All right, so my testimony really starts when I was, uh, and I'll start with, Getting into the details, it was a 30-year-old, younger self of mine um, that I was consumed with this world, okay? I was full of pride, temptation, lust of the flesh, and, and, and at the time, quite a cold heart. Uh, by the measure of the world, I was successful. At the time, uh, I was a task force senior medic with a highly uh, revered special mission unit out of Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina. As, a, as an Army Special Forces medic at the point in my career, uh, there probably wasn't a, a selection or, or some sort of uh, piece that I had not achieved or accomplished at that point in my career. And uh, I was physically fit, I was smart, I was well-trained. At that time, I was learning my fifth language. I had, I know I'm still learning, working on English, but uh, the other ones are good. Uh, as a member of that special mission unit, every member was required to have mastered multiple trade crafts. Again, I went in and as a medic, but then oftentimes as a medic, you're also a sniper, okay? Uh, and that piece of being a sniper, have you ever heard uh, the term, an ounce of prevention is, is better than a pound of cure? And uh, so to that point, again, it's so much better to prevent harm from your service members and your teammates than allow harm to happen. And so let me do it from afar. And if you actually weighed a 7.62 round, it's right about an ounce. And if you weigh a unit of 400 milligrams of, of blood, it's almost a pound. And so that ounce to a pound is kind of unique when you use that, uh, that scenario. <clears throat> So this point in time, when I'm 30 years old, I just finished my seventh deployment. That particular deployment to South America, our mission uh, was to gain intelligence, and everything I'm going to share with you tonight is pretty much, it is, it is open source. Um, our mission there was to gain intelligence, as Hezbollah uh, is in South America, and they are, they're doing everything from laundering money, human trafficking, uh, moving massive amounts of drugs, and uh, financing uh, what they're doing globally. So my mission there was to really to gain intelligence of who's who in the zoo and then identify where the threats were and when and if needed to eliminate those threats. So as we were coming back, uh, I just finished that deployment. And uh, that deployment was different than my previous six in a sense that my team uh, dug deep. In, and as we dug deeper and deeper into what was going on, uh, into that inner web and inner circle of human trafficking, did it really reveal the depths of evil and pure wickedness that I really have never fathomed before? And uh, so it's one thing to go to Iraq and Afghanistan and have an adversary in that sense. But then when you see where this is involving uh, little boys and little girls and innocent people, it, it comes to another sense of a level of evil that, uh, again, as a 30-year-old man, I've never witnessed before. As I completed that deployment, I had to go back to Miami to the headquarters element there for to debrief and then really to help build uh, another additional task force that would come to a major role in uh, further disrupting and targeting those types of activities. When I arrived in Miami, uh, one of the first people that I met there was uh, uh, an army chaplain. He was a mountain of a man. He made me actually look pretty small. And uh, this guy had a 25-year career as a special operator that was as uh, renowned within our ranks and then after about 25 years felt the calling where God said you're done with that now you're going to go and you're going to tell all these guys about God he was one of the first people that met me off the airplane that day uh, coming back and uh, I thought it was a little strange he was with somebody else and so uh, but by again by no mistake that was divine intervention 
I was there for two weeks and went through this planning process of exactly what we were doing. And uh, this guy would routinely show up, we would talk, and we'd go through some of the planning scenarios. And I distinctly remember one time, we were over here and we were looking at a bunch of stuff and he was over here. And as I glance over, he had tears rolling down his face. Uh, some of it was about what we were, the intelligence that we found, everything we were having to do and what we were planning to do. And again, you could just see where uh, this, this mountain of a man was uh, just heartbroken. He, later that day, he invited me out. We, the next day we had, we joined together and he invited me out to dinner and we spent hours catching up, hours just talking. It was phenomenal. And here I have this guy talking to me and he starts to weep again across to the dinner table for me off of my, what he can see is my brokenness. The things that I was trying to hold in, the life that I was trying to hold together, um, that it, 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 by and large, was really kind of spinning out of control. Again, it was that, that piece that, again, he continued to intentionally follow up with me in that two-week span that I was in Miami. From there, I went back to North Carolina, and I was home for about two weeks. My phone rings, and again, he's calling and just saying, hey, just checking up on you. How are you? How's your family? What's going on? At the time, my daughter was a year and a half old. So as you know, uh, the six deployments before this one, um, many of them, several of them were a year long. My marriage had slowly begun to dwindle. I was never home. I wasn't there to be a husband. I wasn't there to be a father. Even when I was home, I was off doing some other training aspect uh, or, or shooting or something of that nature. And so at this point in my life, uh, after the seventh deployment, my wife and I are actually probably better roommates than we were husband and wife. There was an elephant in the room that I, that I like to say, and she was bold enough to address it. I was home for about two weeks and she says, hey, what about us? And I, and I, you know, I could play dumb and say, well, what do you mean? No, we sat on the couch just as calm as we are right here and we talked about it. We said, where do we go from here? What do we do? Do we stay together? Do we try and fix everything that's, that's happened in the last seven years that we haven't been around to do, haven't been able to around resolve? At this point, it'd be easier just to go our separate ways. We were cordial. We we're both comfortable with it. I looked at my two and a half year old daughter and I'm like, wow, you know, I don't know what I want to do because uh, I love, absolutely love what I do, uh, in, in, you know, in this aspect of my career. That night, uh, it, my, the conversations that chaplain had with me multiple times, I went back to my daughter's room and I went over to the corner of the room. Here's her window and her crib is right here. And I got down on my hands and knees and I put my hands in there and said, Lord, if you are real, if all of this is real, I said, I need your help. I know what I want. I want to go pursue this career and I want to have a, a great time doing it. But I really feel brokenhearted about where my wife is with this and losing my daughter. The next morning I woke up and I had an overwhelming, overwhelming peace with saying, Rick, go to work and tell them you want to let it go. I needed to prove to my wife that, you know what, she was number one, that my, my job wasn't. Amen. In doing so, I had to show her that, you know what, I'm in business. I'm going <laughs> to change jobs. That day I went into... Walked, out, walked in and talked to the, uh, the colonel and the sergeant major and said, hey guys, uh, I need to change jobs. I need to go drive a desk for a little while. And uh, they told, hey doc, we totally understand. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Within the special operations arena, you're fenced in and you, can go do, you, know, you can't really go a whole lot of places, but it was great. So they said, hey, you're going to go out and you're going to go be a, a SEER school instructor. And it's like, fantastic, I love it. <clears throat> Two weeks later, I get an email from our human resources manager for orders to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I said, uh, Sears School's over at Camp McCall. What am I going to Minneapolis for? So I, I hit them up and go, well, guess what? There was a glitch in the system. Hmm. No, that was divine intervention. So in this glitch in the system, do I, do I land a job not only driving a desk, the most lethal thing I had there was a stapler. <laughs> okay, so uh, I became, I, I became, they put me in charge of the, the uh, Minneapolis Military Entrance Processing Center where you, all the, the sons and daughters will go into the service and they go through their, their medical aspect. So they put me in charge of, of administratively running all of those things. And I thought, wow, 
This is so disappointing. I went from literally a tier one, fast action, high moving organization. Yeah, so now it's me in the staple. Okay. Well, lo and behold, we were there for about a month. And my wife says, hey, you know what? I think we need to go to church. And I said, you know what? Yeah, let's give it a shot. What do I have to lose? So I go to church in Apple Valley, Minnesota. That's about 20 miles south of Minneapolis. And I went to about 65 Sunday services uh, where I felt that I was the only person that pastor was talking to. 65 consecutive, and I'm like, man, he has got my number. You know, uh, and again, it, it was a church a little bit smaller than this. Attendees of about 250 people and uh, 65 services. He was talking just to me. The Lord was refining me as I was talking about. He was molding me as I, as I allowed that ice to break off of my heart, as I listened to it. I actually began to go to uh, the Wednesday services, and I went to a Bible study with a retired pastor, and this guy just poured into me, Pastor Dukin. And did, did I finally start to understand what the Bible meant? How many of you guys, and again, when you become a baby Christian, you'll read the Bible and you say, man, that does not make sense. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm reading this and it's that. I'm like, Shh. the timeline's all messed up. Like, isn't this thing going chronological order? No. Like, well, why would they write it that way? You know? So, so again, it was me making heads or tails out of this and me putting forth the effort. Furthermore, through that, did I learn the importance of having something like this. Again, if you, if, if for some people can dive in and my wife can read it, could jump in her Bible and read it, and it makes complete sense. For me, if I do a daily devotional and it wakes, walks me on target, kind of puts things in a broad, broad perspective, and I tie in, and I go back in here, and I find it in here, and I really dive into the Word, and you pray on it, that's where you get that growth. From there, God had bigger plans. So my term there, my tour there in Minneapolis saved my marriage in a sense. My wife knew that I was serious. I was like, hey, well, we're going to go do something else. I'm going to drive that desk and I'm going to operate a stapler. Through that, that demonstration says, hey, this marriage is worth fighting for. And we did. So you guys know this February, February 3rd, we celebrate our 24th wedding anniversary. <laughs> So the first time in my life, I say, Lord, put me where you need me. The ball's in your court. I know where I want to go. I want to go back to Fort Bragg, right back into the kind of stuff I was doing. But Lord, where do you want me? Feel in my heart, he wants me to go to Germany. All right, well, let's go to Germany. We do that. He puts me in charge of 176 men and women as a first sergeant and says, hey, in 10 months, you're bringing these men and women to Afghanistan for a year. And through that, did I really start to get into my Bible? Through that, did I really feel a calling? Through that, did I see where God had been working in my own life? And I'll say that there was an aspect of my life that, you know, through uh, going to church there in Germany, that going to church, uh, certainly Minnesota, had really grown me as, as, as a Christian. And uh, there's a piece, there's a psalm in there that I found uh, it, a few months before we went to Afghanistan. Psalm 144, and it says, Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He is my loving God, my fortress, my stronghold, and my deliverer, my shield of whom I take refuge and who subdues people under me. And at the time, it was, that was so matter-of-fact in where we were going in preparation for what I was going to ask these uh, service members to, to do. But God spoke to me in a way that not only is it that, but when he trains my, my hands for battle, and my, my, my screw, excuse me, trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, was understanding how to flip through my Bible and find Bible verses and fight like that. And fight through prayer. So now it was fighting like a man, and it was teaching me how to do so in the Bible. From there, we, we uh, have a successful deployment, all 176 people to return from Afghanistan safely. And, uh, and, and about 40 of them, just through conversation and our year there together, uh, have I now found that they have found their way, and they are now uh, on, their, on charge and on fire for Jesus. Amen. Yeah. So as I finish up here, so as I 
putting this up here, we were, um, again, I have the duty station of choice. Where do I want to go next out of Germany? I wanted to go to Alaska. I'm at the tail end of my military career. I said, wouldn't it be fantastic to live in Alaska? It would be. Absolutely. That's where I want to go. God, where do you want me? And that's my wife. I said, let's pray about this. This was Sunday after church. I said, next Sunday after church. I said, write this down on a, write it down on a three by five card. Let's change cards and see where, where you feel led to go. Sunday after church comes and we had written them down. I had actually written mine down Tuesday night. Wendy had written down hers Wednesday morning. Sunday comes, we exchange cards and on it is Fort Polk, Louisiana. My, my, uh, my, my manager says, what are you thinking? Did you not understand? You can go anywhere you want to go, literally anywhere. People come to me five times a week asking not to go there. And you're asking to go there? I am. They're like, what? And I said, yep. God calls me. I'm going to Fort Polk, Louisiana. And I, they were like, okay. I get orders there. Two months later, uh, two months later, I get a, a phone call for my younger brother. I couldn't have timed that any better. <laughs> two months later, I get a phone call from my younger brother that lives two and a half hours from there. That he's getting a divorce. God set things in motion where I was just like, yeah, uh, I would never have gone there. I would have been in Alaska. My, so I go there and I get to walk my younger brother and teach him how to fight like a man through the Bible. And as, uh, as they go through a divorce that he doesn't necessarily want, but continues to have a fantastic relationship now with his ex-wife, where uh, they are much better friends than they were, ever were, husband and wife. But again, the, to the point that their kids still question, like, Are you guys going to get back together? But again, it is truly just a friendship. So from there, um, I really get tied into a church there. We were there five calendar days, and our kitchen lights go out. And I'm at work, and my wife calls up the handyman and says, hey, I need to uh, you know, come fix the ballast in the kitchen. And this seven-year-old guy comes in with a ladder, and she's like, oh, you're the handyman? So he's up there, and he's fixing this ballast, and... Uh, it's those that were new, this and that, says, well, have you guys found it? And she's telling them, well, I think he's literally seen a sign on the wall that says, me and my house, we serve the Lord. And he's like, have you guys found a church yet? No, not yet. He invites us to church. That was our home church for the next two and a half years, where to this day, they are like family. I still talk to my pastor down there frequently. We will share text messages. I still talk to friends and brothers in Christ down there. And uh, again, many of it's just deer hunting and duck hunting stories, but again, it's all great. My time there in Louisiana came to a pivotal point where God really spoke to me and says, okay, Rick, remember when you were a little baby Christian, you were this 30-year-old broken man that we really had to shepherd along. We had to do a lot of care and feeding. We had to grow you. Then you became a teenager. We could let you run a little bit longer, a little wider. Then you kind of become real strong what you're doing. But now I reach a place where he was like, okay, you're no longer this little baby Christian that needs to be care and fed anymore. Now, church, you're going to do that care and feed. You're going to pick those guys up. You're going to pick up your brothers in Christ. And you're going to pick up the ones that need help. And you're going to go talk to them. You're going to minister to them. And you're going to continue to teach them, again, how to fight like a man. So with that, we find ourselves here in Virginia. Again, praying, Lord, where do we go next? I didn't know a single person here in the state of Virginia Praying, where do I go after I retire? I said, Lord, where do you need me? Where do you need me? As I'm transitioning from one, uh, uh, retiring out of one piece into there, I find myself getting a, a phone call and uh, saying, hey, Rick, do you need a job? And I was like, hmm, this is odd. We're this organization of Washington, D.C. We have interviewed eight people. Six of those eight say, if you're looking for someone with that, that knowledge and talent, you need to get a hold of Rick Kohler. So after the sixth person, we just said, hey, do you have his phone number? So they call me out of, no, out of nowhere again. Again, this is where God is working, saying, as I'm praying, Lord, open the doors you need to be open. Close the doors you need to be closed. And being faithful with it. And when God puts you in place and you pray about it and earnestly you feel that's where you go, then go. So I found myself here now in Virginia for two years. Absolutely love it. And again, God continues to provide. God continues to be on the move. So as I finish up my testimony tonight, 
Uh, it, is, it is so imperative that as we continue to bond, as we grow, and as we share our stories, that it is one that is, uh, uh, again, out of love. And what I mean, you'll hear Pastor Chris, you hear Pastor Doug all the time. I love you, man. And they mean it. So all of you guys out there, as we are continue to, again, grow as men, uh, there's nothing wrong with having that brotherly love. Come on. Amen. Okay? So to finish my testimony today, it's not that I don't want, I, I don't want anyone to have to go through the challenges of this life without the Lord. To face the world unprepared and filled with, without being filled with the Holy Spirit and really being able to fight. Again, fight like a man. Get out there, pray, and know your Bible. I want to echo Pastor Chris when he says, I want everyone to understand there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Thank you, guys. Stephen Clink, come on up here. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. I'm Stephen. Most of you probably don't know me, but if you walk into a church service on Sunday morning and you go like this, I'm up in the booth. Um, <laughs> so that's why most of you probably don't know who I am. I uh, haven't seen my face, but uh, I've been coming here for five and a half years now. And uh, I can honestly say that it is the best five and a half years of my life so far, and I'm 40 years old. So um, God has done amazing things ever since I started coming here. Um, God was doing amazing things before I started coming here to get me to start coming here. Um, <laughs> so a little bit of backstory on me. Um, I was born in 1983, and then we're going to fast forward a bunch. So, you know, we're not going to cover the whole 40 years. Um, but I grew up, I was born into a Baptist uh, home. My dad is a Baptist pastor. And so, you know, I've always been around the Bible, around God, around the Word. Um, but most of the time growing up through, yeah, the first 25 years or so, uh, most of my time was sitting in a pew going, yep, uh-huh, that's cool, yep. I was made to be there. I had to be there. I was a pastor's son. Everybody expected me to be there. Um, so that's why I was there. Uh, I didn't really make a connection with the Bible it was more a religious thing. So we always were taught who God was, what you had to do with God. That's about it, because the pastor's going to tell you what the Bible says. You don't really have to read it. Uh, he's going to tell you what it says. And, um, you know, he would encourage us to read it. But then why bother reading it? Because it's what it says, it doesn't make sense. It, King James, it's the only thing you're allowed to read. And I didn't understand it, but why bother? Because the pastor's going to tell me what it means anyway. And that's, that was my upbringing. But uh, as I got older, you know, 20, 25, I started realizing that the word of God that I was reading didn't really make sense with what I was being told it was saying. And, you know, I'd see people on a Sunday and real smiles and happy and they all had ties and jackets on. And then you'd see them on Monday and you were like, wow, you're not the same person. You're a Christian? Come on. Um, and I really didn't want to be part of that. I'm not a fake kind of person. You know, when you get around those people, you can tell they're just kind of fake and it doesn't really mean anything to them. They just call themselves a Christian because it's the thing to do. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be part of that thing. And I always believed in God, never really had much of a connection with him. I was always told that he's this big guy in the sky with a big stick going to beat me up when I sin. So why would I want to be part of that? Um, but when I was about 25, I started kind of getting away from home, uh, moved away to another state, and uh, was able to not go to church anymore. Great! I can stop being fake. Well, the problem is, um, what I replaced God with in my life was all this other stuff. Um, and y'all can probably figure out, you know, all this other stuff. Uh, girls drinking, whatever. <clears throat> and... None of that satisfied me. As everybody knows that has gone down that path, none of that is ever going to satisfy you. I didn't understand that at first because um, I was still trying to fill 
whatever it was that was missing in my life that I didn't understand. And nobody had explained what it was. So I'm out here in the world trying to figure out what it is that I'm missing. And through the time, um, I don't know, about eight years, um, my grandfather passed away. He was a very instrumental person in my life. And that kind of set me into a spiral. I already stopped going to church, so I wasn't getting anything about God at that point. Didn't read Bible, you know, forget that. Um, but Papa died, and now the one rock in my life that was real sincere and didn't change is gone. And I went down a really dark path really quickly um, to the point over the next about eight years there um, of trying to fill the loss with drinking girls, um, whatever I could get my hands into, partying, not really into drugs or anything, but, you know, the rest of it's bad enough. So um, I, I spent that time and finally at the, towards the end of it, got to the point where I got the feeling of, there's no point for me to even be alive anymore. Um, and where that thought starts from, it continues and it leads you to, I just need the end of my life. Come on now. And that's not a good place to be. Right. If you've ever been there, it's not a good place to be and you understand that. But what I didn't realize was there was a way out. Um, and through that time, I wasn't looking at God. I wasn't looking for God. I didn't want anything to do with church. Um, like I said, I know God existed, and at some point in my life, I'll come back to him before I die, and I'll go to heaven, because that's what we were taught. <clears throat> uh, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior when I was five years old. I'm good, covered, don't have to do anything else with God from there. Wrong, um, but that's what I was taught, and uh, that's what I was, my, where my mind was. So I'm out doing my own thing, don't want to do this anymore, because my life's miserable, um, I have nothing to show for myself. I have no anything. I was working. But what really is that? Um, you know, when you're working just to work, yeah, that doesn't matter. They're going to replace me next week anyway. Um, so I stopped caring about anything. I didn't want to be part of anything. I didn't want to know anybody. I didn't want anything in my life. And there were multiple times that I can remember planning to not be here anymore. And the one time that I, there, there was a big mountain coming down a mountain. Uh, we lived up in Pennsylvania. You come down a mountain and then the, sh the road, the bottom of the mountain takes a sharp right hand turn. And I mean, it's, it's boom, boom. And if you don't turn and really slow down, there's a cliff face right here. <clears throat> and there were probably 50 or 60 crosses on the cliff face of people that didn't make the turn. I'm coming down this mountain not slowing at all. I'm probably going 60 miles an hour. If you took that turn more than 20 miles an hour, you were done. I'm coming down the mountain at 60 miles an hour. No plans of turning. I was done. And I got to the bottom of the mountain and the car turned. I cannot tell you to this day how it turned. I don't know. Thinking back now, there was an angel got turned the wheel. You know, I understand that now. But at the time, I had no clue. I never saw the angel. Still couldn't, couldn't tell you, you know, but at the car turned. That was a turning point uh, in my life where I realized that maybe there is something to this. Um, so I kind of stopped then doing the partying with the girls and the drinking and moved in with my brother in, West, in uh, Maryland. And... Wasn't a good good spot. He wasn't in a good spot. <clears throat> um, but it got me to thinking, at least. He started going to church then after about a year. Um, he took me to church with him. I still didn't want anything to do with God or with church. Um, I tried a couple of different churches just because, you know, that's what I've been brought up with. So I'm going to go to, back to a Baptist church and try that. Well, same thing. I would see him all on Sunday, and then I'd go to work on Monday. And guess what? There are those same people that are acting like Karens and not representing God. So what's the point? It's all still fake. There's nothing changed. Same thing for the last 25, 30, 40 years, 35 years. And I just don't want to be part of that. Church is meh. Um, so fast forward a little bit more. Um, skipping a bunch here, but uh, God told me that I was moving back home. This is where I was born. 
uh, right across the river in Kilmarnock. At this point in my life, I'm in Maryland, uh, Western Maryland. And God told me, you're moving back home. I said, yeah, okay, you know, sure. I've always wanted to be here because this is where this, this area always has felt home. But there was no way for me to quit my job. You know, I had no, no connections here to be able to transfer. I had no anything. So I said, sure, you know, whatever. God, you arrange it, I'll do it. Because um, at that point, I still didn't really, you know, God was this guy in the sky. What a big stick. Why do I really want to listen to him? But over the course of the next two weeks, a position opened up at the company I was working with at Lowe's in Tappahannock. I called. I said, hey, you know, I'm putting my hat in the jar. They did seven interviews over a two-day period. I did it, my last, the last interview. They said, okay, cool, thanks. We're, you know, we've got all these other interviews. We'll make a decision in the next two weeks, and we'll let you know. 30 minutes later, they called back and said, we've got a job. You want it? I said, sure. I had no home, nowhere to stay, no nothing down here. I said, sure. Two weeks, and I'm moving. Okay. So started looking at houses. You know, long story short, uh, moved in with my uncle who lives down here. Uh, hadn't really talked to him before, really. I knew him. You know, we'd hang out with Papa when Papa was still living. Uh, but that was about it. So anyway, I called my uncle. I said, you know, I'm moving back to the area. Hey, um, do you got a room? Uh, so anyway, lived there for uh, six months and found a home. Um, that was a whole nother God provided the home story. But uh, I had looked at 17 or 16 homes throughout the area. And uh, this one, when I walked in, God said, this is it. And again, I'm still not listening to God. Don't, you know, he's still over here in this big sky and got a stick. And, but as soon as I walked in, it was like, this is the one. Okay. So I made an offer. It was accepted. Got a house. Cool. Now I've got a job, got a house. Life is good. No, it wasn't. I was still far away from God. Didn't want anything to do with him. Still working at like an alcohol or a workaholic. And a uh, guy I grew up with met, with, met him again. And uh, he's like, hey, you want to go to church with me? Sure. Why not? So I come the first Sunday, sit in the pew. It's great. Pastor Chris is telling a whole bunch of lies. This is great. Yeah. This is church as usual. <clears throat> the reason why I say that is Pastor Chris was speaking the word of God. I have been taught this other stuff and had this messed up view of who God was. Pastor Chris is telling me who God really was, is. But my thinking was, he's lying. Because that's just a bunch of fluid. That's nothing. Um, John 10.10, 10, Quentin, if we could. Um, sorry, I got Quentin to put up the verses just so it's faster and easier. The thief comes in order to still kill and destroy. Stop there for a second. My life was a whole lot of everything had been stolen. There was nothing left. I had been killed, almost. Um, there was absolutely nothing. I was completely destroyed in the physical realm. And... I didn't understand that it wasn't God doing that to me. Right. I thought it was him. Right. Because, you know, sickness, oh, that's, you've sinned, God's given it to you. Things are going badly, oh, that's because you've sinned and God's doing that to you. That was my understanding of who God was. Pastor Chris is telling me something completely different. And the whole time I'm going, wow, he's lying. He's lying. That ain't in the word of God. Yeah, it is. He's putting it up on the screen and I'm reading it for myself. I get home and go, okay, this is wrong. This is wrong. Oh, no, it's not. Well, that's weird. I've read these verses before, but they didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> My understanding is what was messed up. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that I'm Jesus, God, came that we, they, may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. That's the God we serve. Yes. My understanding at that point was, that's not God. That's, I don't even know what that is. I can't tell you how many times I've been, had read that verse, but never understood that God was the one doing the good stuff. Yeah. The devil's the one doing the bad stuff. My understanding was, God was the one giving me all of this. I mean, look at Job. God did all of that to Job. No, he didn't. Have you read Job? Read it again. God's not the one that did that. Satan is. 
I didn't understand that. I had a warped thinking of who God was. Um, so mm -hmm. over the course of the next about six weeks of sitting here listening to Pastor Chris tell me lies and realizing that they weren't lies, that my, my understanding was the lies, not Pastor Chris and what he was saying. He was showing the word of God. Mm -hmm. Why I stayed, I don't know. Because, like I said, the first Sunday, Pastor Chris is telling a bunch of lies. I don't you know. Do. But what I realized was after I got home, you know, I started processing the service. It didn't feel wrong. You know, if you get somewhere and somebody's just feeding you a bunch of lies, you can kind of feel it. You kind of know that that's probably just a bunch of stuff. Yeah. I didn't have that feeling. So I came back. Heard some more lies. Realized that my lies were the ones that were up here, not the ones that I was hearing. So I started studying a little bit more in the scripture. Pastor Chris would give the scriptures references and stuff, and then I would go home and study them to just to relearn what the Bible actually said. One of the first things I noticed was that Pastor Chris didn't just use King James. The reason for that, in my understanding, is because the King James says it one way, New Living Translation says it another way, the Passion says it another way, Amplified says it another way. One of those is going to click in your head and make you understand what the Word of God says. Um, you may not like one translation. You might like a different translation. The purpose of different translations is so that you can get it in your head and understand what the Word of God says. So as Pastor Chris is preaching, I'm realizing that there's other translations out there that might say it a better way or a different way. Um, so Colossians 2.10, I told you they weren't going to be in order. <clears throat> so you also are complete through the, your union with Christ. So I can be complete? I had had holes in me all my life. That's why I was searching for all these other things. None of them satisfied me, but I was searching for them. I tried them. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Being complete is what I needed. That's what I was missing. That's what I was searching for. Just like most people that haven't found a true understanding of God, we're all searching for something. We just don't know what. Yeah. I was saved at five years old. I could have been complete for all of my life. I wasn't because I had a misunderstanding of who God was. Right. I can be and should be complete through my union with Christ. Until I realize that my union in Christ is what makes me complete, I'm not complete. Um, as you say, faith begins where the word of God or the will of God is understood. That's so true. I didn't understand any of this until one day sitting in the church. It clicked and I was like, oh, so my understanding of God, he's not this big guy in the sky with a stick getting ready to beat me up. He's the one that loves me. Yes. Amen. Colossians 3, 4, if we could. When Christ, who is your life, and the rest of the verse is great. I'm going to park it right there. When Christ, who is our life, when we live our life and realize that he is everything to us, he is everything, Amen. that's when our life begins. Um, 2 Corinthians, I didn't give it to you, it's fine. 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17, any man who is in Christ is a new creature. We are begun a new life. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Read that verse many, 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 many times. But I didn't understand that that old person is gone. Stephen that was born in 1983, he doesn't exist anymore. I am now a new creature in Christ. And I'm complete. That was never a thought in my head. Five years, five and a half years ago now, um, like I said, I had been coming for about six weeks. Um, and the Holy Spirit, you know, Anybody that prayed in tongues the way I was brought up was of the devil. That, that was just junk from the devil. That's what I was taught. First Sunday here, Pastor Debbie got up, did her, did her tongue thing, and wow. You know, I now understand that that's God speaking to us. Then, I had that, I don't know what that was, but I didn't feel that it was wrong. And that was the part that, that clicked in me. Something's not right here. I don't know what it is. Now I know my thinking is what was wrong. It wasn't the word of God. It wasn't the tongues. It wasn't God speaking to us. It was wrong. It was my understanding, my thinking. Amen. Um, 
James 1, 16, 17. Yeah. So my friends, don't be fooled by your own desires. That's where I got messed up. I wanted all of this stuff. And it wasn't right. It wasn't going to complete me no matter how much of it I had. That's right. And I didn't understand that. But don't be fooled by my own desires. Every gift God freely gives to us is good and perfect. God doesn't give us the junk. Right. This is one of the verses you used in the series, um, Who God Is. And well, the message was Who God Is. It was the um, identity series. But uh, this was one of the verses. Every, good, uh, every gift God freely gives us is good and perfect. Amen. It's not the bad. Right. He's not got a big stick. He's not trying to beat me up. That's right. He's got the good stuff. It's perfect for me. That was I'm the only one that he did it for. Now he did it for all of you too, but he's the, I'm the only one he did it for. And it's good and perfect. And you can each say the same thing. We can all say the same thing. He did it for me. And I'm the only one. Because he wants to completely complete me. Christ who is my life. Romans 12. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because, all, because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. That's my job. I'm the one that has to make my life a living sacrifice to him. It's not me that lives anymore. That Stephen died. The one that was born in 1983, it died. And you now have Stephen, who is Christ, through me. I'm a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. Don't, verse 2 there, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. That's what I was doing. For, for 35 years, I was trying to be the person that this world was making me to be. And that's not who God wants me to be. Don't copy that life. It's not going to complete you. It didn't me. It won't complete anybody. The only completion is in Christ. Don't copy this world, but let God transform you into this new person by changing the way you think. When you get this thing out of the way, for me, five and a half years ago, what I consider my salvation moment, I was saved when I was five years old, but when I gave my life to God, to Christ, five and a half years ago, he made me a new person. By changing this. He got rid of all the junk that had buried me for years and years. And he made me into this new person. The verse that really got me to the point of realizing that, you know, I knew that all of the stuff that I had done for the first 35 years of my life, I knew all that was just, I needed to get rid of it. It was bad. I needed to not be there anymore. But how can I go from that to where God wants me to be? It's a hard road. You, you can look at it. I was looking at it going, there's no way that I can get rid of all of this baggage because of all the stuff that I've done. There's no way that I can be used for God. No. It, it's just, there's no way. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 10, 13. There's no, the temptation in your life <clears throat> is no different from what others experience. So we all go through the same stuff. Right. We might have a different aspect or, you know, a different flower of the same stuff, but it's all the same stuff. Yours might be a rose and yours might be a tulip. Mine was a chrysanthemum, but it's all the same stuff. They're all flowers. It's all the same temptations. Might be different things, but it's all the same temptations. <clears throat> and God is faithful. Praise the Lord. Yes. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted... He will show you a way out so that you can endure. All of this stuff that I've done in my past that was weighing me down, that I could never get over and past and, and grow to be the person that God wants me to be, he's already made the way out. All I have to do is listen to him and then take the step. Because as soon as I do, he's faithful. God is faithful. He will get you through. He will get you on the other side. Five years ago, I would have never thought, never thought it was possible that I would be representing the church and God on social media to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at this point. But that's what I'm doing. 
Because God. Not because Stephen. But God. God is the one that makes the way. Makes the way out. And creates you and I a new person. And without that, I wouldn't be here tonight. I can tell you that. I was the guy that was back there in the corner that would never even come to one of these things. Because then I'm, you know, I've got to talk to people. And I don't do For me to be up in front of y'all talking to y'all never would have happened five years ago. That person was completely different. I don't like that person anymore. I don't even want to go back to being that person. But I'm not going to be that person because God has made me new and he is faithful to show me the way out and to keep me where he's made me and put me. Amen. Praise the Lord for all of you. Thank you. Praise God. Powerful, isn't it? Regular people. Regular man. And the last one tonight uh, is, a, is a man who's been in this church, uh, my goodness, long, long time. Long time before I got here and he served in every area of ministry and just a beautiful brother, Brother Steve Daniel. Thank y'all uh, for y'all to be here on a Friday night. All these men, it's, uh, yeah, it is. It's beautiful. So uh, I was born again in uh, on uh, Easter Sunday, Easter, 1976, 1976, and Pastor Chris, if you heard. He was born Easter Sunday, 1986. Pastor Doug, 1996 on Easter Sunday. Anybody else born again on Easter Sunday here? <laughs> I wish we had uh, Reverend Joe Morris here because he would make something of that. <laughs> <laughs> he could line that up and, and he'd, he'd really make something of that. But anyway, um, I uh, when I first gave my testimony way back in the day, in fact, uh, I was, uh, it was uh, Huguenot uh, School, Huguenot High School in Richmond, Virginia. And the pastor was uh, Pastor Charles Hammett, uh, which he opened up a church, Christ Community Church. And Bob, uh, uh, Bob and Betty Ann Howell, Bob was the administrator. And I used to, uh, watch on uh, Saturday night, I'd watch uh, my favorite show, Gunsmoke. <laughs> and when Gunsmoke would go off, and some people, I don't know if y'all remember this or not, Gunsmoke would go off, and this little, maybe five minutes would come on, and it would say, Justice and the Circuit Rider. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Pastor, Pastor Liverman? It wouldn't say Pastor Liverman's name. It would say, say the horse's name, though, which was Justice. And... Uh, then it would say, when it went off, it would say, Cobbs Creek, Virginia. And I'd say, where in the world is Cobbs Creek, Virginia? Well, little did I know that, you know, several years later, I would be living not too far away from Cobbs Creek, Virginia. <laughs> Started coming here, and actually, when Pastor Chris and his brother were down at the storefront, we would come there, you know, on the weekends. I worked at DuPont. God got me that job. God got me the job um, when I retired from DuPont. Uh, working for a flower bulb company, and uh, that was a good job, but uh, I had the best job I've ever had, and uh, that's with anybody familiar with Bay Transit, little bus company, yeah. yeah. so uh, that's a great job because I get to uh, minister to people, have a captive audience, yeah. Yeah. and so uh, <laughs> if y'all don't mind for the rest of this, you know, I can, turn my back and, <laughs> and I can minister, you know, you know as, as we go. But anyway, you know, and, and people, uh, you know, they're so uh, receptive, you know, uh, to hearing the word. Uh, it's a situation where they are, you know, uh, they need to ride and so forth and all like that. So it's a great job, you know, and I, I enjoy it and all. But, um, but my testimony, part of it, you know, when I, when I first gave my testimony, like I was getting ready to say a little while ago, you only know what you know, and that's your, your family, you know, when you're coming up. My, my family situation wasn't good. My father was an alcoholic. 
so forth and so on and all like that. And everybody probably got a lot of guys in here that could testify to that. But, uh, you know, God is, uh, is in the change, people changing business, as we heard many times before. God is, uh, he'll, he'll break those generational curses. My father passed away when he was 54 years old. I prayed for him on his deathbed to receive Christ. So that was a major victory and all, but he is a, a, a you know, a generation, he, he breaks those curses because uh, I had a brother that passed away on Father's Day from a massive heart attack due to alcohol. Another brother that passed away, same thing, due to alcohol. And we got another brother that is struggling, you know, with some mental issues and all like that. But uh, we, I was talking about being born again, you know, 76, 86, 96. The other thing is, it's eerily uh, strange is Pastor Chris and I have sort of the same uh, testimony. You know, as you, as you, you know, go along, you kind of tweak your testimony. But, you know, for the first, I got born again, like I say, when I was between 21 and 22. And so I say that uh, I never went to church or rarely ever went to church. Never shook the preacher's hand. Never prayed every night because I didn't know the Lord. Always got in trouble for doing bad things. Not got, didn't get in trouble. You see where I'm going? Up. Got baptized at Central Baptist Church, you know, uh, up on Cordes Road when I was uh, 23 years old. When I did get going again, interesting thing about that is the same, like Pastor uh, Doug was saying, you know, we're all, most of us in here, just regular guys. And so when the, when the Lord, you know, uh, gave that call, and of course, it took me weeks of sitting in the, in the chair until I finally, after about three or four weeks, I finally went up front and gave my, you know, heart to Jesus. And then I worked rotating shifts, so I didn't think I, I didn't go to church the next Sunday, but the following Sunday I went. And all that time it took so long you know, to come to Jesus. And the week after that, I went back up. The week after that, I went back up. I think I skipped a week. And the week after that, I went back up. <laughs> so the pastor, you know, let I me mean, know that pastors are, you know, they're merciful and compassionate, and they don't embarrass you and all. And let uh, I me mean, know everybody needs a pastor. And I'm going to throw this in for free, too. If you, call your, if you just call your pastor Chris or Doug, you're missing out on a lot. Because they, you know, a lot of things have rubbed off on them from where they go to conferences and they talk to other pastors and, you know, they, they share and all like that. So, you know, uh, you should always call, you know, your pastor, your pastor. But um, so that my pastor pulled me aside, Pastor Charles Hammett, and he said, <laughs> Steve, uh, you're not losing your salvation. You just need to renew your mind. You know, uh, wash it with a word every day and all like that. So that made a difference. And of course, about a month after that, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. But um, I do want to kind of leave y'all because it's been, you know, a long night. What time is it? Anybody know what time it is? 8.42. Okay. All right. So this tonight, you know, I'm noticing that, I don't know how y'all feel about this, but kind of got the, the feel of a, Comedy club, Friday night comedy club with the lights and all the way they are and all. But I do want to tell these uh, two stories. I think I talked to Brother Larry about, you know, sometimes when you get into comedy, it can fall kind of flat because uh, not everybody has just the same sense of humor and all. But I think I can tell these two stories and maybe uh, tie it in a little bit. Y'all you know, might see, uh, you know, where I'm going with it and all. So um, there was... Um, this salesman, and uh, he was out in the country, an old country farmhouse, and he goes up to the door, gets ready to knock, but he gets distracted. He notices that um, a pig runs through the farmyard, and he, you know, kind of got a puzzled look and all. So anyway, he get ready to knock on the door, but the, the farmer came to the door and said, can I help you? He said, yeah. He said, I'm here. I'm selling my wares. He said, um, but I... I couldn't help but notice that. Anybody heard this before? No. Sure. But don't give it away. <laughs> so he said, uh, he said, uh, I couldn't help but notice that uh, 
you had a pig run through your farmyard. Farmer, do you hear it? Isn't it? No, 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 no. <laughs> he said, you had a pig run through your farmyard. He said, but he only had three legs. And uh, the farmer said, um, yeah, yeah. He said, uh, can I tell you about this pig? And uh, the salesman said, sure. So he said, well, um, one night, the wife and I were getting ready to, you know, just settle down and go to bed. And he said, uh, I heard just the biggest commotion. He said, I got up, looked out the window. My barn was on fire. He said, before I can even move and get down there, he said, the door swung open and out come the horses, out come the, the cattle, the cows, out come the chickens. And right behind them, was this pig. He was grunting, squealing, making all kinds of noise. Chased them all out, saved all my livestock. The salesman goes, wow, he said, that, that's some pig. The farmer said, yep, yep. And uh, the salesman said, but uh, he didn't, he doesn't have a three leg. Well, the farmer said, well, can I tell you about that uh, pig? <laughs> and the salesman said, sure. And he goes, uh, he said, uh, one night, the missus and I are coming back from church, coming down the lane. The lights, they uh, fall on the front door. Front door, you know, comes open. Here comes two masked men out. Right behind them is the pig. <laughs> Nipping, squealing, grunting right on their heels. And uh, down the lane they go, never seen them again. And the salesman goes, wow. He said, that's some pig. Farmer said, yeah. And uh, the salesman said, but still, I couldn't help but notice that it only had three legs. <clears throat> and so the farmer said, well, can I tell you something about that pig? <laughs> and the salesman said, yeah. And he said, I was out uh, plowing uh, way down on the back 40. He said, I, you know, hit a, a just a deep rut and the tractor fell over. I fell off and I got pinned between the tractor and the ground. I no way, I couldn't, I couldn't get out. He said, I tried to call, nothing. He said, I was so far out. He said, then out of nowhere comes this pig. <laughs> Gets up underneath the tractor, grunts, wiggles, makes all kinds of sound, lifts the tractor up where I could pull myself out. <clears throat> and the salesman goes, wow, that's some pig. And, they, and he said, but I couldn't help but notice it didn't have the three legs. <laughs> and, uh, and the farmer said, well, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. He said, if you had a pig that was that good, did all those great things, he said, would you eat it all at one time? <laughs> <laughs> I say all that to say we all we've all heard before about um, we've all heard before about how it works. We've all heard before about how it works, you know. But I can tell you, you know, how it works. They don't amount to anything. And if we put ourselves in a position, especially as men, because men we're notoriously loners, you know, we'd look, we'd rather spend all day by ourselves you know, in a tree stand or out on our boat fishing, you know, that's just our nature and all. But, you know, the enemy can call you out and he can carve you up. Yeah. So I hope that kind of will stick with you. You know, sometimes a little story like that, when you go home, you're like, they were good testimonies, you know, but that pig. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one last story I'll tell, and that's about uh, this fella that uh, worked at a fancy car dealership. He was all excited, couldn't sleep that night before because he had to, uh, he didn't have to, he wanted to get up and get into the showroom because he was given the, the task of the newest model coming in to drive it, figuring all the bells and whistles and all that, so he could, he could sell it. So he gets in, he gets in the vehicle, you know, beautiful vehicle, takes off. Next thing you know, before you know it, he's out, you know, rolling along the country roads doing about 60 miles an hour. So he's checking everything out and all, you know, he's liking this. And something catches his uh, 
uh, you know, in the corner of his eye in the rear view mirror. And uh, he's like, I know I just didn't see a chicken. And uh, sure enough, he did. He saw this chicken. So he said, well, you know what? He said, I'm doing 60 miles an hour. This thing is right at the bumper. He said, I, he said, I can't go back and tell the guys at the, at the showroom that, you know, a, a chicken was, you know, doing 60 miles an hour. So he smashed it, mashed it down with, on the accelerator a little bit more and uh, gets to going 70. Looks back, doesn't see it. But then he looks in the side view mirror, and there the chicken is right up by the quarter pound, the rear quarter pound. <laughs> he's like, what in the world? And he, this is really perplexing him. So uh, he uh, mashes down a little bit more on the accelerator, gets to going 80 miles an hour. And uh, he thought he had left the chicken behind, but next thing he knows, the chicken is right there beside his, the door. He can look right out. So he looks right out. Well, he notices that the chicken has three legs. <laughs> and he's like, what? So he mashes down, just going by 90 miles an hour. Anybody heard this one? <laughs> he gets to going 90 miles an hour. So he's going 90 miles an hour. The chicken is keeping up with him. And at that moment, the chicken kind of looks over at him and just... Off he goes, leaves him in the dust. So this guy, he's just beside himself. He pulls over, puts his head down on the steering wheel, and he's like, you know, I don't know what I'm gonna do. But about that time, he hears somebody tap on the window, and he said, uh, uh, you having trouble, sir? And uh, this old farmer, probably might be the same farmer with the three-legged <laughs> <laughs> uh, He goes, are you having trouble, sir? Can I help you? He said, no, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. He said, don't worry, but I'll be okay. So he gets ready to pull off, and he says, well, hold on a minute. He said, uh, I just uh, was out here testing this uh, sports car out, and uh, I noticed that uh, this three-legged chicken was faster than the sports car. And the farmer goes, you know, you could tell the realization. He said, yeah, he said, that's, that's my chicken. He goes, what? He said, yeah. He said, the wife and the children, he said, they love chicken, you know, chicken legs. <laughs> and the guy goes, okay, it all makes sense now. So he gets ready to pull off, but then something hits him. He stops. He goes, let me ask you something. He goes, uh, how are those chicken legs? He goes, I don't know. I ain't been able to catch one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's don't be like the three-legged pig, let's say the three-legged chicken, you know, run away from the enemy, don't let him catch us, you know. And so, anyway. Yes. Um, Pastor Dell, you want to be close? Okay. Uh, you got any counselors? Yeah. Mr. Johnny? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to uh, close now, um, and uh, let's bow our heads. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Uh, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We hope that uh, something that some of these men have said can be an encouragement, can exhort these men here, Lord. But we know the most important thing, the first step is, is to get into the kingdom. And uh, that's what we're going to address right now, Lord. If there's anybody here...